Oh my God. TEDx SSE. What should I talk about? Um, 3D printing, perhaps, or uh, renewable energy, or um, uh, social entrepreneurship. Well, I considered all of those things, and then I realized, no, this is going to be about the man on the right. This is going to be about Gerard. Gerard is my grandfather, and he was born here in Stockholm, and he played the piano, boogie boogie style, and he played the saxophone. And when he was 24, just like me, he proposed to my grandmother, Lotta. And Lotta said, yes. And he was really psyched about that. So he, he hugged her as tight as he could, and he fractured one of her ribs. <laughs> so really passionate guy. And now, Gerard is still with us today, but only to a certain extent, because a few years back, we started noticing some, some changes with Gerard. And as, as you may be predicting now, he basically started having some slippage of the mind. So uh, he's regressed into Alzheimer's disease. And since that hits your memory first, he's starting to lose his grip of what he did five minutes ago, what he did yesterday. And it's come to a point now where he recognizes Lotta and a few more people, like his daughter. But um, that's about it. You know, this picture was taken just a few days ago. And Jarad said it, it was a cool idea to show it here, show it in the talk. But by now, he doesn't know we're here. And he doesn't know about the talk. Actually, he doesn't know about me. And I find that very sad. But actually, I've, I've also found it um, kind of inspiring because it's shown me a different side of my grandfather, really. And I'm here today to talk about that side. I'm here to talk about Alzheimer's disease and what it does to your brain and your memory. And I'm here to talk about how in a world where declaring who you are is becoming more and more important, we might have something to learn from a man who doesn't know who he is. So, Gerard got his diagnosis. And at the time, I was studying to become a psychologist. So I had all the opportunity in the world to think about the neurons in my grandfather's brain. I knew that when amyloid precursor proteins were being made, there was this enzyme that's supposed to cut the protein at the right place, and then it sort of starts messing up. And because of that, these little peptides called beta amyloids drift away from the cell in a way that they shouldn't, and they get stuck together into a type of biochemical garbage called plaques. And I also knew that inside the cells, the tau proteins that are supposed to support the cell structure were becoming hyperphosphorylated, and that basically leads them to also stick together into this type of biochemical garbage called tangles. And I knew, unfortunately, that wherever you looked in my grandfather's brain and you would find plaques and tangles, that's where the nerve cells were no longer talking to each other, and that's where they were dying. And that's Alzheimer's disease. So this must have started actually several years before we saw any symptoms, close to the bottom of Yarad's brain in an area called the entorhinal cortex. It's a nice word too, if you want to sound smart, you know. And then it gets better. And then, you know, um, it actually spread upwards to the hippocampus. And when it hit Yarad's hippocampus, that's a really big deal because the hippocampus is like the inbox for new memories. So when the cells there stop talking, when they die, he gets some inbox problems. And the, the messages he has stored there, the memories, start falling away. And the new messages that arrive, the new memories, like, oh yeah, who's my grandson, can no longer be received. Um, and, hmm. Um, this isn't just any memory we're talking about. You should mention that. You know, when psychologists talk about memory, they talk about two types of memory. They talk about 
declarative memories and non-declarative memories. And the hippocampus usually processes and stores these declarative memories. And those are the things you've learned that you can easily say, declare. The things you can package into words. And, uh, you know, it could be episodic memories from your life history, like what did you do yesterday? Or um, how did you spend New Year's Eve? And to a certain extent, it's also semantic memories about facts and figures. So, um, what is TED? Or what's your phone number? Um, stuff like that. On the other side, there's another group of structures in the brain called the basal ganglia, just above the hippocampus, really in, in the middle of Yaraj's brain. The basal ganglia are more associated with the other type of memory, non-declarative memories. As you can hear, these are the things we can't really declare. These are silent memories, like, you know, movements and habits and intuition. It's all the stuff that's difficult to package in words, really. So that's, you know, remembering how to ride a bicycle or um, getting a gut feeling based on a past experience. And what I found most fascinating about this divide is that it really helps me understand my grandfather because plaques and tangles are really destroying his hippocampus. And with it, they're destroying his declarative memories. But the basal ganglia and the other structures associated with non-declarative memories are all pretty much fine. And you can see that in him. He still rides a bicycle if he wants to, and he still gets a gut feeling based on a past experience. And he lights up when he sees me, even though he can't really say who I am. And um, as this part has started disappearing, as the declarative parts are falling away, the non-declarative parts are much easier to see. Because, you know, one thing goes away, the other one kind of becomes more apparent. And um, I found that pretty cool. Because if you think about it, we live in a time when we focus a lot on the things we can declare. We focus on who we are and what we've done and what we aspire to be. We focus on the things we can say and the things we can type and the things we can post. And so, layer by layer, we're creating this image of ourselves. We're creating a concept of who am I with all these bits and pieces from our declarative memory. And there is no better, you know, um, the clearest situation is when you're making an online profile and you have all these little boxes where you fill in bits and pieces. Oh, who are you? What have you done? Peter Berggren, SSE speaker. You know, stuff like that. So you fill that stuff in and then you're really happy with what the profile looks like, right? And everybody does this. If you look at historical estimates of the global human population, you can say that more than 1% of, every, of all humans who have ever been alive have an active Facebook account. So they log in more than once a month. And when they do, they communicate the things they can type and the things they can post. And while they're at it, Facebook provides another box where you can write what your political views are or what your favorite band is. Now, Yarad wouldn't stand a chance because Yarad doesn't know what his favorite band is. But he feels it. When you play him the music he loves, he has the full experience of what his favorite band is. And what do you really think is cooler? Declaring it on Facebook or having the experience? So he can no longer store the bits and pieces, but what he has left is this immediate version of himself, this tiny slice in time when Yarad is whoever he happens to be at that point in the day. Plaques and tangles in his hippocampus keep him from knowing what he did an hour ago. But whenever you meet him in his pointless confusion, he is this remarkably joyous and gentle person. And he does that with his non-declarative memory. He does it automatically by habit, like riding a bicycle or like getting a gut feeling based on a past experience. And so he lights up when he sees me, even though he couldn't tell Facebook 
anything about his grandson. Jared is the most beautiful, non-declarative personality I can imagine. And in a time when it's so easy and so important to show who you are, it just made me think that in some cases there may be a good thing about becoming curious about this silent side of ourselves, this non-declarative side, the stuff you can't pack into a sentence, that immediate version of yourself, the tiny slice in time, when you are whoever you happen to be at that point in the day, regardless of what it says on your Facebook profile or what you put in the script of your TED talk. So, Alzheimer's is really dismantling a person I love very much. But it's also showing me a new side of my grandfather. And because of that, I, I can't help but feel that there is something vaguely triumphant about how Yarad is forgetting. And so I wrote a triumphant song about my hero and how he forgets. And I thought I would play it here now. It's called Murfar. Thank you so much for listening. In a gown, barefoot and cold. I'm but a stranger out in the hall. I don't remember this at all. I looked afraid and they asked me why. I took a guess and then I replied. I took a bow and I went back is my head, the sky is turning red. 